Hello, this is Rachel from thehealthyroom.com and this is my presentation about natural family planning methods. It's going to be a little bit lengthy, so make sure that you are somewhere where you can concentrate, you've got some quiet, you're not distracted by anything, so that you can get the most out of this. Now, today I'm going to be covering a little bit about me. Um, I'm also going to be talking a little bit about various historical practices. Um, more out of interest and why they may or may not have worked. Um, the basics of the menstrual cycle and what signs are used so that you can understand enough about each method and why they work and why they may not work um, and the advantages and disadvantages and then we're going to compare the effectiveness of natural family planning methods against standard contraception. And just one word of advice, you'll not be able to use the information that I give you in this lecture to practice natural family planning in any way after this webinar. It is purely just for information to give you a bit more of an idea of what's out there, how you can use it, where you can find further information and learn it properly. Because that's the key thing, each method only works if learned properly. So to give you a bit of context, about myself first of all. So I'm a fertility massage practitioner, a natural family planning teacher, and also a nutritionist specializing in women's health. So my goal in life is to help all women get rid of their irregular periods, so they have nice regular periods, no period pain, no PMS, no strange symptoms like icky stuff or clots coming out in their bleed, so that people can have pain-free periods, PMS-free periods, and if you want to conceive, that you can conceive. Um, and when I started this journey, I've got 15 years of experience in various fields of complementary therapies. And I've also got quite a scientific mindset as well. And I do love the woo bits, and I also do love the more sort of evidence-based stuff too. And what really interests me is the fact that a lot of the things that seem very spiritual are now being proven and backed up by good science and good data and that's what really interests me. So one thing that has always interested me is the menstrual cycle and I do remember when I was younger um, hearing people joke about the rhythm method and that it didn't work and that some families are really huge but they're Catholic and various different jokes and I did wonder how that worked. And then later on when I became a fertility massage practitioner um, we were told about Billings ovulation, when to spot the fertile time to optimise fertility for couples. Um, and then I looked a little bit more and people talked about the basal body temperature method and how that was effective for being able to tell when people have ovulated, but obviously that's in the past. Um, and I looked at it and thought, well, there are quite a lot of disturbances that affect that. And then with a bit more... Um, research I found out that Billings has quite a, a number of disturbances and it doesn't explain the whole picture and then I ended up looking at the various symptothermal methods which takes both into account as well as the cervix signs so this is really um, a description of my journey and the various different ways I research different methods um, and they are quite difficult to find relatively reliable information out there if you can find any at all. And knowing what to look for when you're looking for this information can be really difficult. So I'm hoping to frame this as something where you can go away, think about the different methods, find out a little bit more about each one and which one suits you the most. And that's the key thing, that you make an informed decision. And it might be at the end of this that you decide that it's not for you. But it's given you the information to decide to do that, which would be great. But the key thing about my practice is that I like all my clients to understand informed consent and that they're using a method that works for them and works for their body. So, let's move on. What is natural family planning? It's actually describes a group of different methods. They all include discussing your intention with your partner and this is something that I find it's a crucial part of every relationship and yet it's something that seems to be not discussed. So you hear stories of gentlemen saying that um, they thought their partner was on the pill and 
suddenly she got pregnant and they don't understand how and there's a lot of blame going on there and then you hear about various different sort of accidents or accidental conception and equally um, sometimes you hear in couples where one of them doesn't like condoms therefore the other one has to be on the pill regardless of whether it's giving her any side effects or not and it surprises me actually when I started working with couples and even just with women the number of people that haven't discussed their intention of when they would like to start a family with their partner um, it really did shock me that it's possibly the biggest decision you will ever make in your life is to bring in a new life and whether you want to or not and yet it's the one thing we don't discuss in relationships so the intention is such a key important issue that I would highly recommend that you discuss this with your partner anyway regardless of whether you want to continue looking at natural family planning or any other method whether it's a barrier method or a hormonal method it really is something key that you should decide together so there have been various iterations throughout history of natural family planning including barrier methods so there are lots of recordings of um, condoms being fashioned out of animal intestines and other gut um, plugging methods so I've heard of in ancient Egypt people soaking sheep's wool in lemon juice and putting that up their vagina now interestingly the lemon juice would have killed off any sperm um, but the leaving the sheep's wool up there that could leave the poor woman open to infection and you can't guarantee that you'll get all the fibres of the wool out so they can get stuck in the pockets of shawl which are little pockets in the vagina um, so it would not be ideal and I know some people will use menstrual sponges these days and for the reason that little bits can be left behind and you can get TSS and things like that um, or various different infections from certain materials I don't recommend those kind of plugging methods. So there are differences in fertility between men and women. Men have a pretty straightforward system. They create sperm, it takes three months to mature and develop properly and then it's ready to come out. They're fertile all the time. Any time of the month, any time of the day, they are fertile. Women however have a more cyclical um, fertility pattern until they reach menopause so women have the beginning of the month they may possibly be infertile they're likely to be infertile they may be possibly fertile there are various different signs that you can look for for this then they hit the fertile period leading up to something called ovulation which we're going to discuss in a minute and then after they've ovulated they have a definite infertile period so it's the women that really can control the fertility of their family from the point of view that they have fertile times, they have non-fertile times. Um, but one thing to bear in mind is when couples are having issues trying to conceive, various different issues that can cause reproductive problems and infertility. Infertility lies a third with the woman, a third with the man and a third with their um, DNA combined so it's not always the woman's fault that the couple can't have a baby it could equally be the something wrong with the man it could equally be an issue with the couple coming together either the mechanics of what they're doing or the DNA of what they're doing or she could have antibodies against her husband's sperm there's a whole array of issues so it is a joint choice a joint responsibility um, but it is useful to know that men are fertile all the time, but women aren't. So, I'm going to summarise the menstrual cycle. And there are four distinct phases, and people often think it's very strange that I put menstruation at the front because it's the end of the cycle. The reason we count the first day of menstruation as day one of a cycle, regardless of what method we look at, is because it's the easiest sign to spot. Uh, most women are aware of when they're bleeding so for that reason that is why that is always our day one once you can spot other signs 
your view of it changes, but we always use the first day of menstruation, even if it isn't a proper flow, even if it's just sort of thick, clotty, dark blood, that is still your day one. So you have your menstrual phase in which lining is shed. You then have your follicular or proliferative phase, and it's got two names because some people say it's the follicular phase because the follicles are being developed and matured in the ovaries and other people call it the proliferative phase because the lining of the womb is proliferating, it's growing, it's getting thicker. After that we have ovulation. Ovulation itself actually happens over a period of about 15 minutes but we say there is an ovulatory phase because the period in which your body tries to get you pregnant um, by increasing your libido and changing certain signs actually lasts a period of about three days and you have actually about eight days of fertility, sometimes nine with some women, sometimes a bit longer, sometimes a bit shorter. So we consider the ovulatory phase to be around three days and also some women do double ovulate and if that happens it will happen within 28 to 48 hours of the previous ovulation and when this occurs is when you get non-identical twins. So then after you've ovulated, you have the luteal phase. And in this phase, your body is trying to work out if it's pregnant or not. And it's trying to create the safe environment for the baby. So your body temperature heats up um, as an, a way of being an incubator for the baby. And the embryo will try and implant into the lining. And that would only be if it's fertilized. If it's not fertilized, it won't implant, but your body doesn't know that. After a, a while, your body works out. You haven't, in fact, been fertilised, and then it drops all the hormones, and you have a menstrual bleed. It's actually a lot more in detail than that, but that's just the overall, just so that you can understand. So I'm going to show us the signs in a little more detail now. So the signs that we look at, the first, most obvious one, is the bleed. So as we can see here, we have we start off with this womb and it's the progesterone and the estrogen levels have dropped, so this lining is coming out in the bleed. And then we have this empty stage where um, the lining starts to grow and then the eggs start to develop. As you can see, it's getting thicker here. And then it gets thicker again in this fourth picture. And then at the very end, you can see it, the lining is at its maximum thickness. And this is so that you've got the blood there ready to nourish an egg. So the next stage, looking at the egg cycle, we start off on the left here. We've got this egg, it's growing. As you can see, it's getting bigger and bigger. It's developing inside its follicle. And then in the middle, the follicle ruptures, and this is ovulation releases the egg, the egg is received by the fallopian tubes and if there's sperm in the fallopian tubes it may get fertilised. If not the egg will continue on its journey through and eventually come out with the menstrual bleed. The follicle left behind then hardens into white fibrous material known as the corpus luteum. The egg whilst it's still alive um, creates something called HCG, human chorionic hormone, um, which is assigned to the corpus luteum to produce progesterone. The progesterone has a, um, a thermic effect on the hypothalamus, which warms up the body. If the corpus luteum stops receiving HCG hormone from the egg, it stops producing progesterone, and then um, the lining sheds and your body prepares for a new cycle. The final two signs, and these are ones that we observe, we have the cervix sign and the mucus sign. So when we are bleeding, our cervix is at its lowest position and it's closed. This is the um, opening you can see the blood coming out of here. Throughout the month, um, as we lead to ovulation, the cervix rises and this opening gets wider. And this is something you can feel with your fingers unless um, your cervix is too high to feel. 
so that's the cervix sign and then after ovulation it closes again and it goes lower again. Mucus sign, there are actually four different types of mucus throughout your cycle. We look at when it first appears and then how it starts changing in texture and when it first appears you'll see it's sort of thick, clotty, tacky, it's opaque, it's usually a whitey creamy colour. And then it gets thinner, um, it gets stickier, it becomes clearer, and eventually you should get to your peak day, which is almost like raw egg white, and there's lots of it, and it's very slippery. It feels quite cold, and it feels quite wet between your legs. And then suddenly it'll drop off, um, because your body's no longer trying to send, um, get the sperm up to the egg. And the reason why we have mucus and why it's a key part of fertility is that your mucus, um, it can. there are two types that can form a plug in the cervix and protect the uterus from infections and sperm. And there are also other types that suck the sperm up, even from outside the body, which is why they say when you use a condom that you should, in fact, um, not have any genital contact this is because if you have any genital contact and there's any sperm released in the precum and there is fluid around genitalia, this can collect the sperm and sort of suck it up and it's actually known as motorway mucus sometimes because it literally sucks it straight up to the womb. And this is only the fertile mucus. But that's why it's so important to understand how to use condoms properly too. Um, so those are the different signs. We looked at the blood. The egg you won't see happening, but you'll feel the effects. Your libido will increase. Your cervix you can observe, and your mucus you can observe too. So one other thing as well that confuses people about when they're actually having a period. So the next thing I'm going to cover is what is a true menstrual bleed. Some people will have some bleeding around ovulation. And this is in fact just called spotting. And this kind of bleeding isn't actual, actually a menstrual bleed. It's where the lining has grown to a maximum, but it's still growing a bit more. So the upper layer drops off and sheds. Um, withdrawal bleeding, when you're on the pill, this is just a bleeding that happens because when you stop taking the packet, because you're on your seven um, pill-free days, or you've got sugar pills to take, um, and this causes a bleed, it's just... Or withdrawal from the hormones. So a true menstrual bleed is a bleed that only occurs after you have ovulated and I'm going to cover how you can tell that you've ovulated later on. The whole layer is shed so it's not just the top layer and because it's the whole layer you will get a proper flow. You may get some thicker darker stuff at the beginning or the end but you will have a flow and it will be a flow for at least three days and it's very different to spotting or withdrawal bleeds. Ideally you want a flow for three to five days, especially if you're looking to conceive because this means that your hormones are balanced enough to produce a thick enough lining for an egg to be fertilized in. So this is what we aim for, a three to five day bleed. Some women bleed slightly less, some women bleed slightly more and if you have no other signs or symptoms such as PMT, PMS or period pain, we don't worry about it. But if you have any symptoms or you are trying to conceive, three to five days is the magic number of flow. So the first method we're going to look at is the famous rhythm method. The rhythm method works by assuming all cycles are 28 days long and that you ovulate on day 14 and that you don't have intercourse around this period of time. So the advantages are it's pretty easy to do, you just need a calendar and to know when the first day of your bleed is. Um, it's not affected by any disturbances and it pretty much requires the least amount of work. So the disadvantages, it's only around 70% effective and to be honest with you I thought it would be less effective than that but that is the official statistics. Um, it's between 70-74%. Some people even go as high as 76-79% to 79 effective. Um, but as you probably know, most women do not have a perfect 28-day cycle. Cycles can be healthily anywhere between 26 and 35 days. Some people have shorter again, some people have longer again. 
Some people have phase defects, which is where the luteal phase, or even sometimes the follicular phase, although it's much less common, um, are a bit shorter than they should be. And sometimes we have really long follicular phases, especially if we've just come off the contraceptive pill. So as you can imagine, this isn't the most accurate method. Um, after that came the calendar method. And this came when a doctor observed that ovulation pretty much happened 40 day, 14 days before menstruation. And in a way, sort of right. Um, at the time, most people had pretty much even regular cycles. Um, now it's becoming less and less common. We're getting more women with phase defects. And it's looking like the contraceptive pill and other hormonal methods are causing this when women come off. Um, those methods of contraception. But anyway, it used to be a bit more accurate than it is now. Um, there is no data giving us how accurate this is, so at a bit of a guesswork, I'd say it's probably around similar to the rhythm method, maybe slightly more um, effective, but we have no data. So the advantages are, again, it's pretty much easy to do. You assume that regardless of your cycle length, if you take away 14 days, that gives you your ovulatory time. Um, so you just need a calendar and you need to know when you bleed and how long your cycle is. And you need to be able to subtract 14. So again, this is not a particularly reliable method. But it is easy. It doesn't have any disturbances. Um, I've just realised I do have some data. It's around 97, sorry, 90% 90 effective. So the disadvantages are it's less effective than standard contraception at 90% and it assumes that there is no phase defect in the cycle. So it's assuming every woman has 14 days in her luteal phase. So moving on to the more um, accepted methods, we've got the temperature method known as the basal body temperature or BBT method. This method involves taking your temperature first thing in the morning, every morning, and we determine when ovulation has occurred. And once it has occurred, you can then practice intercourse without conceiving. And you can also take this data and plot it out to work out when you ovulate in your cycle and work out when you're going to ovulate so that you can indeed have intercourse if you are trying to conceive at the correct time. So other advantages is that it's personalised to you and post ovulatory infertility is completely safe. Using this method there is a way of um, predicting your pre-ovulatory infertility um, but it's not quite as reliable um, as some other methods. So some disadvantages, you must be consistent. This means every single morning, the second you wake up, you have to take your temperature. And this is really key. Your basal body temperature is the temperature that your body is at at rest. The minute you start walking around or even just moving your arms, metabolic processes are increasing in your body and therefore it raises the temperature of the body. So you must have at least three hours rest. And there are disturbances, which means that the temperature will not be accurate. These disturbances include alcohol, illness, stress, travel, feeling unwell, certain medications. It can also include if you wake up at a different time, but there is a way of adjusting the time appropriately. And it does require learning a set of rules to understand and use it properly. And I should point out the temperature method is the only way outside of a blood test that we can, can confirm that you have ovulated and therefore that you can have intercourse safely after ovulation. Other methods show that your body is trying to ovulate but they do not confirm that you have ovulated and the reason why is, as I mentioned earlier, that temperature rise that happens from the progesterone of the corpus luteum only happens after ovulation, it doesn't happen before, so it is the only natural sign that we have that we can tell that we have ovulated. So next we're going to move on to the symptoms side of what we're looking at. So the cervix only method. 
I don't know many people that use this method. In fact, I don't think I've met anyone that uses it on its own, but I have heard of people that do use it. And this is the method where you record the changes happening to the cervix with your finger throughout the month. Um, the advantages of using this method is that you can tell when your body is going to ovulate. Now one really interesting thing about sperm is the fact that it survives in the body for all, right, around three to six days, which is pretty amazing. So if you know when you're going to ovulate and you have intercourse before then, you can pretty much um, get the sperm in place ready for, for fertilization. Of course, if you're looking to not get pregnant, um, you don't want to have that sperm in place. But this gives you an idea of when your body is preparing to ovulate. Um, and it really can improve your body literacy as well. One great thing about feeling your cervix is that you can feel if you've got cysts on the cervix. Um, and some people can even have even said that they've felt whether they've got the beginning of cervical dysplasia, um, which can lead to cervical cancer. I don't know whether that's true or not that you can feel whether you've got the beginning stages, but it is useful in terms of body literacy to understand what your body is doing. So the disadvantages is that it takes a while to learn, and it usually works best in conjunction with another sign, such as temperature. But again, it only tells you that your body is preparing for ovulation. You don't know if it has ovulated. And I must be honest, it's the most difficult sign to learn to record. Some women can't feel theirs because their cervix is a lot higher than others. And the other thing as well, you have to be very, very careful with feeling inside. You need to keep your fingernails short, non-sharp, so you don't scratch and get any infection in there. You have to wash your hands very thoroughly because it's very easy if you scratch yourself with a fingernail and then you've got dirt in your fin fingernail, you can get bacteria up there. So it's not the ideal sign, but it is a good one for body literacy. And again, you must chart it regularly to feel the difference. So the next sign we're going on to is the mucus sign. This one's really interesting. Um, there is a whole method called Billings Ovulation Method, or BOM for short, based on the mucus only sign. Um, and actually, this was one of the methods that I first looked into in a lot of detail. It's got a lot of advantages to it. Um, once you get used to spotting the various different phases of, I'm going to say cervical fluid, but it's your mucus. Once you get used to spotting the different phases of your fluid, um, you will be able to read your cycle in a way that helps you understand what your body is doing, why it's doing it. And you'll start noticing other changes going on as well. And I really love this method for couples that we know ovulate and they don't have any problems with ovulating, um, who are trying to conceive. I think it's a brilliant method. It's easy to learn. It's easy to do once you have gotten used to um, observing your mucus. And it also gives you a really good idea of your reproductive health. You'll start learning what's a normal pattern for you. And then you can start noticing when your mucus smells different. Um, now, all cervical mucus and fluid has a smell to it. It shouldn't be unpleasant, but if it does smell unpleasant, some people say fishy, or um, another one I heard was raw onions. If it does smell unpleasant in any way, do go and see your doctor, because that does mean that something isn't quite right. Um, and I have one client who, she was doing the symptothermal method, so she was charting her temperature and her mucus. And she spotted her mucus had changed colour, it was actually slightly greeny in colour. So she went to her doctor, um, and she, she had a smear test. And she had very low grade, so at the very beginning stage of cervical dysplasia. So this means that she had irregular cells, um, possibly precancerous, you don't really know, on her cervix. Because it was such an early stage, she actually said to her doctor, well, you know what, I've had really stressful few months. A lot had happened, um, both her parents had died, um, she'd moved house, one of her children had gone through a period of long-term illness. So she had a lot going on, um, and she was very stressed, it was affecting her immunity. 
and the doctor actually let her have three months to really sort out her diet and her stress and she went back and had a second smear test and those cells are gone. So that was such a powerful tool for her and you can see so much from your own cervical fluid. So that's one thing that I do really like. And one place in which it has been studied a lot is in China, especially in rural China. Um, and it was very effective, it was 98% effective, which is pretty good. Um, and the one thing to bear in mind, which I'll go through in a minute, is the reason it was more effective in that particular population. So the disadvantages of this method is that again it only tells you when your body is preparing to ovulate. It doesn't confirm that your body has ovulated. And it can take a while to learn. Some women get it straight away, some women don't. Um, but it can be disturbed by many medications. Um, I've got a two-page A4 list of all the medications that can affect the mucus sign. Now, in rural China, many people do not have access to health care. And something else that has a big difference between um, that population and the sort of Western population, whilst in rural China they do have a lot of stresses on their lives, it doesn't seem to affect their body in the same way. Over here, so many of us are so chronically stressed that our cycle is pushed out by a few days, even a few weeks, by various different stress triggers. And this can look like um, you get a mucus peak and then nothing. You think, okay, I've ovulated. And then you have another mucus buildup and another mucus peak um, because your body didn't feel safe to ovulate at that time, so it tried again. So you, during that whole time you were fertile and if you're using this method to prevent pregnancy and your body is sensitive to stress, this may not be the most um, beneficial method for you to use. But again, it's up to you to do some research and see what feels right for you. Um, there is another version of the mucus method called the Creighton method um, and there's some NAPRO technology I've heard of. This is based on the work of Billings, um, and I should point out actually both the Billings doctors, it's a husband and wife couple, they came up with their method because they were um, Catholic and they wanted something more natural to help them with their contraception, and they were both doctors, so it is a very scientific method, and you can see the fern pattern in mucus, so it is very scientific in its basis and it is very effective. And the Creighton method builds on this, so the descriptors are more in depth. So it has the same uh, advantages and disadvantages as the Billings method. I really like both of them, but in people who are trying to avoid pregnancy, um, I do recommend getting some other data first. And secondly, if you don't know whether you ovulate or not, and you do have other issues with your cycle, that may make you question this and you do want to know whether you're fertile or not, I do recommend one of the other methods I'm going to talk about first and then you can drop down to using Billings on its own um, after that. So the next I'm going to go on to the two symptothermal methods. The first one is known as the fertility awareness method. So this method combines the mucus, the cervix and the temperature methods together. So we can see when our body becomes fertile because we can see the mucus sign coming, we can see the cervix sign happening. And then we can confirm that our body has indeed ovulated because of the temperature change. So this is actually a pretty accurate method and I'll cover the um, effectiveness later but it's usually around 99%, 99.6% maybe it's got a very good um, rate. So the advantages is that it lets you know when you are expecting to ovulate and it confirms ovulation. And the other advantage is because you have the temperature method tracking which does have its own disturbances and you have the mucus and or cervix methods too, um, the disturbances aren't as bad because you can kind of see what else is going on at the same time. So it, 
it does help to have both there. So the disadvantages, it takes a while to learn and the charts do look a little bit horrendous if I'm honest. Um, it can make assumptions on cycle length, I'll explain why in a minute. Um, and it's not as strict in recognising the thermal shifts. Now, one thing I've noticed with the fertility awareness method, and it's sometimes called FAM for short, is that many people who teach it are not certified and they don't understand how to recognise that thermal shift because there is a particular temperature differential that we are looking to spot. And some qualified teachers, I've noticed, do include making sure that you hit the right temperature change on the right day. And others, you can download a package that's about 30 minutes long. And yes, you do have a good idea of how to chart your cycle. However, it doesn't include this. And if you haven't hit that temperature shift, one, it's indicative of a condition that you will need a little bit of help on if you do want to conceive. But two, you technically haven't ovulated. So you are still fertile. If you're trying to use this method um, to avoid pregnancy, it is not quite as effective if you're not getting that thermal shift. The other thing is, when I say it makes assumptions on, assumptions on cycle length, it assumes that your cycle is the same length and therefore your amount of pre-ovulatory infertility is the same each month. So moving on to what is formerly known as the simple thermal method, and NFP is what it's called for short, and it is called the natural family um, natural family planning method. And this is the method formerly recognised by the World Health Organisation. Um, and this is the method that I learnt. Now it combines the cervix and mucus sign with the temperature sign, as we saw before. It has some stricter criteria for recognising when uh, post-ovulatory infertility starts. It also has a stricter method of calculating how much pre-ovulatory infertility you have. So it uses a little bit of, of a calendar method in a way. But we build up data over time to be able to increase the amount that you have. So the advantage is, is that it's fully customised to your body and cycles. You can tell when your body is preparing to ovulate and you can tell when you have ovulated. Um, it's less affected by disturbances and when used properly it's 99.8% effective. It is very similar to FAM and I'll get onto the differences a bit more a bit later. The disadvantages again, it takes a while to learn and it is the most complex. So I said I'd talk a bit more about the difference between NFP and FAM. Um, FAM started off when NFP was more taught, especially amongst Catholic, but more religious couples. And it was taught only to couples. These days it's taught to anyone who is interested in learning about it. Um, in fact, legally, you have to be able to provide it to anyone um, under European law anyway. Because you can't discriminate against people of different religions or uh, whether someone's in a, in a relationship or not. So NFP is taught to anyone and it has been for a long time. NFP, we ha um, you have to be a qualified teacher to teach. FAM, you don't. And the teachers I've met who are qualified are in fact very good at recognising the thermal shift and ensuring that people understand the signs well. A lot of people that teach it aren't actually qualified, um, which you don't get with NFP because you're not allowed to describe yourself as an NFP teacher otherwise. The other thing with FAM, as it seems to be a little less re regulated, is that it comes from the NFP method, um, and therefore it's a little bit further behind. Those of us who are NFP teachers, we have to attend um, compulsory training or take compulsory training, and it is constantly updated, um, and various different experts from around the world work with the World Health Organization, and they work with various different studies of people abroad to try and make sure that we're getting the most up-to-date data on what works and what doesn't. And it's mostly data from very rural populations. Um, and this is particularly true when looking at the lactational amenorrhea method, which 
is one that I'll discuss again a little while on. Um, NFP, you have to learn as part of your teacher training the standard how to avoid and how to achieve for a woman who is cycling. But we also have to learn how to recognise infertile periods for women coming off the pill, for women who are breastfeeding, and women who are entering perimenopause. Not all, but some fam educators will have been trained and assessed on those criteria. So when finding a teacher, I'd really ensure that they're qualified and that they are fully up to date, and that's really key. Um, so let's look at some efficacy rates. Uh, this is using the Pearl Index. The Pearl Index is a bit different to the rates that people are used to looking at. Most people are used to looking at the safety of, for example, a condom, and it'll say 97% effective. This is flipping it the other way around. So on the um, same scale, a condom would be 3% effective, just to give you an idea. So abstinence, we've got completely safe. Post-ovulation methods, which is where you confirm that you have ovulated, either temperature only or simple thermal, if you're just measuring when you have um, ovulated. It's roughly 1% effective, slightly greater. The symptom thermal method, this changes usually depending on um, source, but most people agree it's between a 0.4 and 0.6% effective. I see so many um, fan publications saying it's 0.2. Um, I don't know, but it, it's pretty accurate. It's usually greater than 99%. The mucus only method, whether you're looking at Billings or Creighton is about 3% effective. Calendar only is about 9% effective. So reasons for user effectiveness. So some users may intentionally be um, non-compliant. So they've learnt the rules, they understand them, whatever reason, whether it's they're too tired, they can't be bothered to take their temperature in the morning, they've forgotten to take their temperature, um, whether they've decided to stop observing their mucus, for whatever reason they've decided not to comply, or even they wanted to have intercourse on a day that is not suitable when they want to prevent pregnancy. Um, and one thing is the baby effect, and that is around ovulation, your body is trying to convince you to get pregnant, therefore it'll increase your libido. So that's one thing we always warn women to be aware of, the times they want to take risks are the times they're more likely to be ovulating or near to ovulation and more likely to get pregnant. Other reasons for lower effectiveness, um, mistakes made by the couple. So it's really important that you understand and you ask questions about the method that you're using and that you feel comfortable with what you've learnt. And it's also important to ensure that you have a good teacher, someone who's qualified and that someone really understands what they're doing and that they're supporting you through. If you have any um, method that is online only or book only, I would strongly recommend finding a teacher that will teach you one-to-one -one and will look at your chart with you. Even if it's just in a Facebook group and you submit your chart that way and they say yes or no, you need to move this, you need to move that. Um, so as I said earlier, not understanding the rules or not knowing what the rules are and what to do when your cycle varies are two other reasons. Um, being unaware of disturbances, so not realising that you're on a medication that can um, dry up your mucus or make more mucus appear. Being ill, so you have a higher temperature, so it may appear that you've ovulated much earlier than you really have. Um, alcohol raises the body temperature. Um, getting up at a different time, as I said, we can adjust for that and a good teacher will show you how to adjust for it. And finally, inconsistency. If you're not taking your temperature every day, you may not notice the rise as it occurs. Um, so it's really important, whichever method you use, that you are consistent and that you do use it properly. So let's just compare that against the standard contraception effectiveness rates. 
So the standard rates, if you've got the male condom, and this is back to the sort of statistics that we understand. So it's usually quoted as being between 97 and 98% effective. The female condom is around 95% effective. The combined oral, um, oral contraception pill or the progesterone only pill um, is around 99%. And of course you must be aware of what times you're taking them and be consistent. Even the pills with um, sort of a 12 hour grace period to take, you must take them at the same time every day because you do lower the effectiveness. Depot, um, so this is the uh, injection which lasts for about 12 weeks is 99% effective and of course you can't forget to take it. The cap or diaphragm which is used in conjunction with a spermicide uh, 92 to 96%. The reason for this being less effective is that, as I said, if you have the correct mucus in place, the highly fertile mucus that's quite like raw egg white, but even uh, before that when it's a lot more slipperier and thinner, um, that will attract any sperm in that environment up into the womb. So you have to use the cap and diaphragm with spermicide. When you take them out, any sperm that has not come into contact with that spermicide could make you pregnant. Um, the ring, it's usually called the nuva ring, which is a ring that you put inside your vagina when you want to um, have protection. And you can take it in and put it out. You just have to have it in when you want it. Um, sorry, when you're having intercourse is probably a bit more accurate in terms of describing it. 99% effective. The implant is again 99% effective and the only method that is 100% effective is abstinence. So the benefits of standard medical contraception uh, contraceptives is that most medical professions understand how they work. Um, a lot of them, such as the implanted or the inserted devices or the injected ones, you don't have to think about them. You're not likely to forget. Um, and one other thing that is really key to point out, condoms are the only barrier method. They are the only method that prevent STIs, that's sexually transmitted infections. So if you're with a new partner, that is the only suitable method in terms of protecting yourself. And indeed, if you're with an old partner and you want to protect yourself. So, disadvantages of standard contraceptives. So, a lot of women um, that come to me experience an array of side effects such as weight gain, mood swings. Um, there's something called pill-induced polycystic ovarian syndrome and post-pill syndrome. So, pill-induced PCOS is because basically when you're on the pill, it's been shown in small studies, um, there's not been enough studies on this, but the data is quite strong, that the longer you're on the pill, the greater you uh, become insulin resistance. And insulin resistance is the trigger for polycystic ovarian syndrome. And post-pill syndrome is where you come off the pill and your periods don't return. Um, and up to 10% of women won't get their periods back, depending on the age range. It does change for different age ranges. So one thing to be aware of, and that many women aren't told when they first go on the pill, and they're usually on it for many years at a time, is that they may not become fertile again afterwards. Or they may need to do a lot of work on their lifestyle, on their exercise, on their nutrition in order to get that back. Um... You do need to learn how to use any method that you use properly, and that includes condoms. So during your fertile time, when you have this mucus, you need to make sure that there is no genital contact without the condom there. Some women um, have sued because their implant hasn't been put in the right place. Uh, one other thing as well is that sometimes having a coil or something similar um, can cause internal trauma um, and you can sue if that happens to you but obviously you don't want that to happen and some women become infertile from that trauma. 
um, the reliability of all hormonal methods can be affected by various different medications, especially the oral contraceptive pill. That can be affected by anything that upsets your gut flora or your stomach, such as um, antibiotics, or if you're ill and you've been sick, that can affect your ability to absorb the medication. So whenever you have any other medication whilst you're on a contraceptive method, um, that is hormonal, you do need to check with your doctor whether it interferes with that. And finally, and this one may seem a bit obvious, but it isn't acceptable by some religions to use any form of chemical or barrier contraceptive method. So the most famous example is the um, Catholic Church, but in fact many other religions are in, um, they have a similar stance. So, the overall advantages of natural family planning is that you get to learn about your body. Um, many people call this body literacy, but it is great. You do sort of start to understand what your body's doing. Um, some women find it helpful because they can tell when they're going to feel tired. tired. They know when they're entering the phase where they have lots of energy. And you can start actually planning your life around your cycle um, to work with it a lot better. For example, negotiations or where you have to persuade someone. Doing this around your ovulatory time when your social skills are at their best can mean that you have a more successful outcome. Equally, women in the luteal phase of their cycle are shown to have um, better intuition. And intuition is basically the making good decisions with not quite enough information available. Um, and it's thought this is because of evolutionary purposes, women in the luteal phase of their cycle, their body wants to protect them. So this can mean that they become better at learning to read and adapt to certain environmental conditions at this time. Um, but we can use that, for example, if you're in a sports team, you can start learning to read your opponents better during that time. So it is pretty powerful to be able to know when you are in what part of your cycle. And as I said earlier, understanding the different signs in your body and knowing what's going on, that can give you a clue to your health and it can really give you a good window. Um, if you are working with a teacher, they can refer you to a doctor with evidence of what's going on for certain conditions. And it's so powerful and you can save so much time with your doctor because you, you can go in and say, this is happening and they they can see what's wrong and refer you to the right person or give you the correct medication straight away. Um, so it is really, really powerful. And also you can see things like the effect of stress on your cycle and then start thinking, well, hang on, if it's enough of a stress that it's affected my body, my body doesn't feel safe, maybe it's something that I can change. And it's a really good way of stress management. And there is so much in terms of your health that reflects in your cycle. It really is a mirror to what's going on in your body. Um, and finally, it is accept and acceptable for all religions and cultures. I haven't come across a religion in which um, NFP is unsuitable. So the disadvantages. It is a pretty unforgiving method if you get it wrong. If you did not want to get pregnant, and you had intercourse at the wrong time, you could get pregnant. Um, the only other backup is going and using an emergency contraception. So you do need to learn it. You need to learn it from a credible source. You need to understand it. With NFP, another difference between that and the FAM method is that each three months we add another layer to it. So you can build up your pattern um, and get used to it. Where, whereas with FAM, I've been told that you pretty much learn the whole thing from the beginning, which is where mistakes are usually made. Um, other disadvantages of NFP, it does not protect against sexually transmitted infections, so you're not protected in any way against anything from things like herpes, gonorrhea, lice, HIV. So do be aware that you do need a barrier method if you want to protect against STIs. It's not suitable if your lifestyle involves consuming a lot of alcohol um, because you'll never be able to confirm when you've ovulated. 
Equally, um, extreme amounts of alcohol can disrupt the mucus sign, so it can change what's going on there. And if you're under a lot of stress, um, again, it'll be a lot more difficult to read. And ditto, if you're on lots of medications, you do need to find a teacher and they can help you work out whether or not this method is suitable for you. And also, if they say it is, they can help you work out how to read your mucus. And finally, it does require learning the rules, and as I keep saying, it has to be from a reliable source and complying with them and being consistent every day. And I won't lie, it was a bit of a pain to get into the habit of taking my temperature every morning and to chart everything from my mucus to my bleed every single day. Once I was in the habit of doing it, it was a lot quicker. Um, but one thing that is quite interesting is that because... I was showing my partner what I was doing and he was looking at it with me. He gets, um, he's got a lot better idea of what's going on with my body and when. So there are other methods that I have heard of. These methods have no data whatsoever. Menstrual sponges I mentioned earlier. I'm not a big fan of these. Um, firstly, if you're vegetarian or vegan, putting a dead animal, um, in your body is probably not what you want to do but they can start breaking away and you can get bits of sponge left in the pockets of short in the vagina which can lead to infection or even just irritation um, which is a big problem of rayon on tampons if you ever feel a bit itchy um, towards the latter days the sponge can have a similar effect when you take it out and leave bits behind it also needs quite thorough sterilization soft cups um, there is no data on soft cups. I should imagine they would be very similar to um, diaphragms and caps and they would need to be used with spermicide but I know that they can also be used during menstruation uh, which was how they're designed. They were designed to effectively plug up um, menstrual bleeding. Withdrawal, um, there is no data on withdrawal. I've heard several people claim that it is really effective if practiced properly, but again, it can only be done on certain times of the month and not when that mucus is there. Um, and there is no data on it, and there is no data showing what counts as withdrawal at what point in the process. Plus, you do also get something called pre-cum, which is where you get a little bit of ejaculate released earlier. Um, so, the lactational amenorrhea method, or LAM for short, this is the assumption that all breastfeeding women are infertile. And that is not true. Um, and again, it was a, a Sam teacher that told me that for six months, all breastfeeding women are infertile. But it turned out she wasn't a qualified teacher. Um, luckily, I wasn't um, breastfeeding at the time, so it wasn't an issue for me. But it was a bit of misinformation out there. So currently, we know that if you're breastfeeding fully and not giving the child any other food sustenance, if you are keeping to a strict set of criteria in terms of um, time windows during the first six months you are infertile if however um, you do not keep to the time slots of breastfeeding or something changes in terms of taking medication or you start supplementing the baby's food then this method no longer applies equally after six months Regardless of whether the woman is exclusively breastfeeding or not, 50% of this population of women who were successful in um, delaying having another child actually became pregnant again. And there is a lot more research going on to try and work out what the difference is between those who remain infertile whilst breastfeeding exclusively past six months and those who have a return of fertility after that period what the difference is and again they're looking at more rural populations to see what's going on there so I'm quite excited to hear about what's going on there if you are interested in the lactational amenorrhea method again do find a qualified teacher and then the final method um, I've heard of is luniception and this is using the moon 
um, to work out when you're fertile and when you're not fertile. Um, there is no hard data supporting this. However, if we look at anthropological studies, um, women who live in non-industrialised areas will cycle with the moon. And there is a book by someone called Louise Lacey called um, Lunarception. I don't know if it's currently available for sale. I've bought a PDF copy of it. Um, but she and some friends got some interesting information together and worked out that you can force yourself to cycle with the moon. And therefore you could, if you understood whereabouts, you ovulated, work out your fertile and your infertile periods. And it was really, really interesting. And it is a technique that I use with my clients where you use a light to um, simulate the moon in order to get regular cycles. However, there is no data on it. Um, and you would have to use another method, even if you did cycle with the moon. Um, to work out when your fertile time is there and then you could use a lunar calendar but as I said there is no data so um, I would be careful but in terms of encouraging someone who doesn't ovulate to ovulate it is a good method to use um, and finally ovulation predictor kits this is something that comes up again and again and again um, and I hear so many women that are frustrated using these kits. So the ovulation predictor kit will tell you by measuring your luteinizing hormone levels whether you are ovulating at the moment or whether your body is about to ovulate at any time soon. But usually when you take this kit you only have a few hours in which to conceive um, and sperm quite frankly doesn't travel that fast. So even if they are reliable, and many kits um, have seemed to tell people that they're ovulating at funny stages when they can't possibly be and don't make any sense, or tell people that they're not ovulating when we can confirm that they have. But even if we assume that you've got a reliable kit, ovulation predictor kits to find out as a one-off, oh I'm ovulating, now's a good time to have intercourse because I want to conceive that's not going to work. If you're taking them on a regular basis and then you can start seeing a pattern then yes you can have intercourse a few days before then and then try and conceive that way. So it is very limited in terms of both accuracy and in terms of actually trying to conceive and have a baby. Um, something else I've heard of is ovulation microscopes and this is really fascinating. Um, you take a mucus sample um, called salivary, put it under a microscope and you get this fern-like pattern that's very similar to your cervical fluid but it's from your saliva and you can see um, this pattern changes when you become, uh, when you're about to enter ovulation. But similar to the OPKs, you have a very small window in which to recognise that your fertility has started. Um, so whilst it's fascinating to understand what your body is doing. It's not a reliable method of trying to conceive or indeed trying to avoid conception. And then the next question I get asked a lot is about apps and understanding your cycle a bit more. So apps can be great. Um, I only recommend using them once you have learned to chart your cycle on paper. Um, if you know what you're doing and you understand them, they can be amazing to use and really quick. However, um, many screenshots I get sent of various different apps, um, they don't have that temperature requirement and I've seen women who are quite clearly not ovulating get excited because they've ovulated. When looking at the um, pictures they sent me, I, I can see they haven't. And it's because they haven't understood the basics. Um, and equally, they haven't really understood how to describe the mucus correctly for the app, so they get very confusing, conflicting things. And also, I've seen the apps, two different apps, track the same data in two completely different ways. So one was saying that this woman was fertile, and the other app was saying that she wasn't. So I would say use apps with caution. Um, they can be useful, but only if you really know what you're doing and you understand what you're looking at to start with. 
And the other thing to bear in mind is most apps are American and therefore in Fahrenheit, but in the UK you can really only buy centigrade thermometers and the same with most of Europe. Um, so the temperature requirement to hit that 0.2 degree rise is actually a 0.4 degrees Fahrenheit rise, um, which is again something to be very mindful of. But apps that I do like, you've got Kindara, um, and you can even buy a thermometer, but again it's in Fahrenheit that syncs to that app, so you don't actually have to do anything. Um, there's Clue, iPeriod, Glow, um, My Moon Time. A website that I do really like is the Hormone Horoscope website, and it's not actually to do with horoscopes. But as I said before, the understanding your cycle and working with it, that's actually something called menstruality. Um, and this is a program, sorry, a website that tells you what you're likely to be feeling, for example, energy-wise, at different points within your cycle. And it is, for the most part, fairly accurate, so I would recommend having a look at that. So, thank you very much for listening. As you can tell, um, I did a lot of research before choosing which method I wanted to choose to train in and I am qualified in an NFP method. I do um, have women that switch to mucus only after a year once they've got enough data and I do love the Billings method too. FAM works brilliantly but only if um, you have got a qualified teacher who really understands it. Um, so if you want to find out a bit more you can look on the internet there are plenty of resources for each method. Just be aware of the source and its reliability. Um, if you want to find out more from me or you would like to learn how to use NFP, I do do teaching for couples via Skype. I do teach individuals as well. Um, and at the moment I'm in the process of creating an online program that will be a mixture of online study and um, live interpretation on a Facebook group. Um, so do let me know, um, there's a sign up beneath this on my website, do let me know if you're interested to know more about that and I'll email you when I've got that program ready. And finally, you can find out more about me by going over to www.thehealthywomb.com. I also have two Facebook groups, I have the Understanding the Pill Facebook group because I have lots of people asking questions about the pill, the safety, side effects. Um, and it's more for women who are interested in dealing with the root cause of their problems. So for example, if you were prescribed the pill because you have polycystic ovaries, because you have um, endometriosis, um, there are various different things that you can do to get rid of the signs of polycystic ovaries and endometriosis and even treat it. Often with nutrition, um, and that can really make a huge difference. So that group is for women who are looking at transitioning off the pill. I also have the Healthy Women Facebook group, which is where we discuss all things to do with women's health, particularly um, menstrual and reproductive health. So please do find me there, and we'd love to have you on those groups. So I hope you found that useful, and I hope it's given you an idea of what to look at, um, where to research, and what natural methods are available for. I haven't covered um, the sort of standard contraceptive methods because there is a lot of information out there about them. So I hope you found it useful and do feel free to contact me if you have any further questions. I hope you have a fantastic day with whatever you've got planned next and thank you for listening. Goodbye.